Well, happy first week of school, everybody, and welcome back. I know you're all in your places with bright, shiny faces, just all excited to be back and to start this course and the rest of your courses in your schedule. Um, I'm Dr. Brian Wisniewski. I'll be your instructor for Security Management, CSS 240, for the next 15 weeks. Uh, this is a blended class, so we'll do a combination of in-person sessions and online work. Um, and let's just jump in. Let's talk a little bit about this class in particular. So at last check, and things changed in the first week, people drop an ad and, and those kinds of things, but we've got a few Homeland Corporate Security majors, and we've got a few safety majors, and we've got a lot of cybersecurity majors. Now, this is a protective security course. So it is not a cybersecurity course, and I know that the vast majority in this class, this term, which is new for this course, I've been teaching this course for a number of years, and um, this is the highest concentration of cybersecurity students I've had. So either word got around that, that you think this course is easy, or the folks over in cybersecurity uh, have you uh, um, mandated to take this course. <clears throat> Either way, it's cool with me. Um, but this is mostly a protective security course. Now, when I say that, I want everybody to relax a little bit. There are many things we do in this course that you can put into your context. So it's okay in a discussion, if I give you a topic in a discussion, let's say, for you to write a post that puts it in the context of safety or cybersecurity, so long as it makes sense and you apply the right concepts. So, um, you know, the, the bottom line is that I want you to be able to use the things you learn in this course, and, and you actually will. Even with a different major, you will. So, um, you know, just, uh, just relax, go with the flow, and put things into your own context. The other thing about this class that I want you to know is we had, uh, at least at last check, we had one sophomore. Uh, quite a few juniors and some seniors. So, uh, and and some of those seniors looks like are planning on graduating in December. Although that's you know an individual decision, and I don't go that deep into uh, everybody's schedule. Um, although I do, <clears throat> quite frankly, uh, look up every student, look at their transcript, look at courses they've taken, and get to know you a little bit um, before the class starts. But we do have a good mix, but mostly juniors and seniors. So I'm not going to baby you in this class. Um, you deserve better than that. You've earned better than that. Uh, if you are graduating in December, though, just keep your eye on the prize. Don't think that you can let up because, um, you know, failing a course in the last semester and having to come back, that's just a fate. Not quite death, but it's, it's pretty bad. So um, keep your eye on the prize, everybody, uh, especially because you're in your later years. I expect you know that drill as well. And since I just admitted that I do go in and do some research on each of you, it's only fair that you know something about me if you haven't done any research or if I haven't had you in classes before. <clears throat> I'm the Director of Global Security for Pfizer, Inc. Most of you know Pfizer now from the vaccines from COVID-19. Um, before that, everybody knew us as the people who made Viagra. But frankly, we make about, <clears throat> I think there's less to uh, skews. There's probably about a thousand different products that we make. It's a company of 100,000 people. Uh, maybe more. Um, actually, I just did a project to, uh, to get everyone new access cards, and I ordered 131,000 of them. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a few extras, but uh, it's a pretty big company, and it covers every um, country in the world. Um, we have operations in both Ukraine and Russia now, and one of my colleagues is assigned to do nothing but work on issues that go on with getting products into both of those countries. Um, I've worked in physical risk, which is where I work in now, security technology, which I touch on now quite a bit. Uh, I've worked in investigations, executive protection in my younger, fitter days, uh, brand protection, which is anti-counterfeiting. Pharmaceuticals are a very highly counterfeited uh, commodity, much more so. Uh, in fact, at one point, Viagra was, more, was a more counterfeited thing than U.S. currency. Um, so... You know, I've been 35 years, almost 36 now with Pfizer. I was in the military before that for six years and worked in law enforcement there, uh, doing similar things that I do now. So I've been been around a while. I guess that just tells you that two things that I hopefully know what I'm talking about and then I'm kind of old. Uh, I have a doctorate from Creighton University. If you're a basketball fan, Big East fan, you probably know Creighton. I have a master's degree in criminal justice from Boston University, a BA in organizational development from Spring Arbor University in Michigan, and an associate's degree from Jackson College in general studies, which is where I really got my start, my first taste for education. So um, of all my four degrees, that is one that I'm most proud because it's the one that, that turned me on to education. 
Additionally, I'm a certified protection professional through ASIS International. That is the highest uh, certification a, a security professional can get. So there are others in cybersecurity, as you know, um, but uh, the CPP is the highest uh, in the physical security realm. Uh, I was a graduate of the International Security Management Association's Senior Executive Leadership Program at Northwestern. Um, <clears throat> certified in both um, basic and advanced uh, interview and interrogation using the read technique. I have a certificate in human resources development from Villanova. Um, you know, if I, if I took a picture of my brag wall with all the little certificates I've gotten, again, I've been doing this for quite some time. So at some point, every time you turn around, somebody's giving you a certificate for something. But um, I have a number of certifications and am just now starting to work on some in the cybersecurity role. Even though uh, I'm at the later stages of my career, I just find it to be interesting the, uh, um, the tie-ins to at least on the investigative side are, are pretty pretty common, so I'm working on that as well. Now that's me professionally and, and me just being me. Um, I've earned a diploma or degree in every decade of my life. I started with you know my kindergarten graduation just like everybody else and went on to a middle school one and a high school one and then an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a doctorate in my 50s. So one in my my single digits, one in my teen years, or one in my preteen years, one in my teen years, my 20s, my 30s, my 40s, and a degree in my 50s. Uh, I am considering um, going to law school in my 60s. I doubt that my wife will put up with that, and I don't blame her, um, but I may give it a shot. Something that you, you, know, you probably need to know is that I go to bed early, and the reason I say that is, uh, unlike... Um, other professors you may have in, in residence classes, um, when they go home, they go home. And <clears throat> unless you are on fire, they probably don't want to hear from you. I'm just the opposite. I want to hear from students after hours. I do my slippery rock work uh, generally after dinner and generally on the weekends. And that's generally when most students do their work. So <clears throat> it, it just matches up well. So I have no no issues with people texting me, especially text me, tell me who you are and what you need, and we'll go over that that process in a little bit here. But um, no qualms about uh, about you texting me at home, you know, after dinner. But I do go to bed early. Um, <coughs> generally speaking, um, I get to bed. I watch two episodes of Family Guy, and then I drift off to sleep. And I get up very early in the morning. If you send me a uh, text at 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night, you will probably get an answer at 5.30, so you might want to shut your ringer off. Um, I live in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I recently bought a place in Grove City, Pennsylvania, to stay at while I'm on campus for the purposes of these, of these blended classes. Um, <clears throat> I was coming into town to do uh, some work on campus. In the past, I would stay at the hotel in Slippery Rock. It gets expensive, and the rooms get smaller every time you go. Um, so it just financially, it was a better deal for me just to buy a place to stay here while I'm here one week a month. Um, so generally speaking, I'm in Grand Rapids. It is in the Eastern time zone, so there's no time difference between campus and my home. I'm married. Uh, my wife and I have been together for 30 plus years. Uh, I have two children, one who's 39, one who is 31, <clears throat> but claims she is 27. And she's always going to claim she's 27, although she looks it. So, you know power to her. I have four grandchildren and two very spoiled dogs that you will hear uh, as background on lectures. Um, one thing we've learned from working from home during COVID is that people have lives, right? There's traffic. Um, when I'm here in Grove City, my neighbors are just, uh, they're, you know, most of my neighbors are, are quite elderly and they, um, they really take care of their lawns. That is their thing. They're mostly retired. So it is not unusual in the middle of a, of a lecture. Uh, for you to hear a weed whacker going in the background. When I'm at home, um, when you know Mr. Bezos sends a delivery to my door, uh, Dr. Diesel and Dr. Daisy, two multi poos, will go crazy and you'll hear them bark. <clears throat> Deal with it. And when I'm on the phone with you, if your dog barks, I will ask you the breed. I'm not going to tell you to stop the dog from barking. That's how people work. So that's that's me in a nutshell. Um, when we get together, uh, if you have any other questions about my background or anything, I can you know, clear up for you, just let me know. So as I just went through this, I looked, I had three slides about myself that, that should make me feel uncomfortable. I hope you didn't think that was bragging, but I do want you to know that I think you're getting your money's worth, at least from someone who knows the drill. Um, what we hope to learn in this class, 
I want you to learn how a security manager uses relationships to add to their success. <clears throat> One of the things about this class that's really um, unique is that as we talk about security management, we're going to be talking about it in terms mostly of relationships. And that's something that's valuable no matter what your specialty or your major or your next job is. So you may get a job in cybersecurity and take a job in finance. I mean, who knows what, you know, what awaits you, right? But you need to have relationships and you need to understand what people do in the workplace. And it's something that, you know, many of you have worked jobs before, but, you know, when you, when you get into the workplace, you know, as I say to my, my children, your first big boy or big girl job, right? Um, you need to know who does what. <clears throat> and we're going to talk a lot about that. And in our session next week when we're together, uh, I think it'll become clear to you why that's important. We're going to talk about how you interact with those internal and external stakeholders. Security managers tend to in, uh, operate with the police quite a bit and investigators quite a bit. And we're going to talk about those relationships. <clears throat> we're going to talk about planning and budgeting. Don't There's no big math in here. Most of you are pretty good at math anyway from what I can see. Um, but we do need to talk about budgeting just in the general sense of how most companies set up a budget and what your responsibilities would be to help set that budget up. Um, every company is different when it comes to budgeting. And when, when people take accounting classes, that's they really try to stay basic with accounting classes because those are accounting principles and you look at the good, you know, good accounting practices. That's a, um, <clears throat> that's a real thing. But as a security manager, as a cybersecurity manager, as a safety manager, you'll be responsible for your own budget and just understanding some of the basic terminology. That's all we're going to do. So don't get math anxiety. I'm terrible at math. No, I'm not terrible at math, but um, it's not one of my favorite things. So we're not going to get really heavy into the numbers. We're going to talk about the promise and risks of ex external partnerships. And external partnerships essentially are the private, you know, public-private partnerships between business and the government. Um, to get things done. More and more, the government is shrinking, right? Although it seems like it's just it's this monster, it, and it truly is. Uh, more and more, the government is calling on industry to do certain things. And even in the regulatory sense, they call on industry to do that. Um, as government budgets start to shrink, they will be calling more and more on industry to do certain things. And that can be a double-edged sword. It's very good for you to have great relationships with the, with the government. Um, but it also has some some red flags that you need to be aware of, and we'll talk about those. Um, and then we'll talk about the intersection of management and leadership in security. And <clears throat> those are two different things. And there is a really good case study that I've used before that I'd like to use again, and I think you'll find it interesting, and we'll do that as one of our sessions. Um, but it's a, it's a real challenge. It's the physical security realm is a very unregulated field. And when people have, have jobs that don't have a lot of regulations around them, standardization around them, they tend to go off and do their own thing. And sometimes when they do their own thing, that's a bad idea. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So how are we going to do all those things? Well, the format of the class, as I said, is blended. There's one in-person session per month. I sent out those dates to you um, in an email. If you did not get those, uh, let me know right away. But uh, everyone who has registered for the class as of, uh, I think I waited till <clears throat> August 1st at least. I didn't want to bother you during your summer. Um, but everybody who was registered for the class got a copy of those dates. They are set in stone because those are days that I'll be driving, or at least those weeks I'll be driving from Michigan here. And I need to make arrangements with my other job or cut my weekend short because it takes about six hours to drive. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to make that uh you know, make those dates set in stone. There are weekly deliverables. This is an online class mostly, you know, blended, but mostly online. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can turn in everything at the end of the semester and be good or turn in everything in week one. I will release the work each week. And at the end of each week, there is something that's a deliverable, right? It's a, there's a quiz, there's a discussion, there's a project. <clears throat> in the in-person sessions, some of those we're going to count the work we do in in the class on those Wednesday nights as your discussion for that week. Doubly important that you be there. Um, but every week there'll be some reading, there'll be lecture, there'll be writing uh, or a quiz. So you have something to do. In the past, students have said that they didn't feel they got enough opportunities to influence their grade. Never had people ask me for more work, but 
hey, you know, I read those uh, those student surveys and I react to those, by the way. So when you do your student survey, rest assured, I take those things very seriously and I adjust my fire. Um, everything's balanced so we can keep the work even. I like things to be on an even keel. You shouldn't have, oh, this is a heavy week or this is a light week. This is a light week and finals week will be a light week <clears throat> per se because we're only going to meet, right? There won't be any assignments. Um, but generally speaking, each week has about the same amount of work as the previous week. The quizzes, discussions, the midterm, and the final exam make up the final grade. Each week builds on the one before. So <clears throat> if you if you slack for a week, don't do the reading, don't do the discussion, don't turn something in, you know how many points you're going to lose right in the grade. And I don't want to harp on grades, but look, everybody, you know, you want to take the course so you will learn something and you also want some reward for it, if nothing else, the three credits, right? Um, but each week builds on the one before. So if you slack for one week, I will be using the stuff from the week before generally in the next week and weeks preceding. So we're looking for you to build your your knowledge in this field each week and each week will build on the next. So if you start to fall behind, it's very hard to catch up. So I just put that out there as, you know, if you if you're a person who does that, um, sorry about that little pop up there. Um, but if you're a person who, you know, will slack for a couple of weeks and then expect, you know, to jump back in and, and be up to speed, it just doesn't work this way, that way in this course. So part of this week's assignment is to read and understand the syllabus. And I do this in all my courses. If you take a course with me, another course with me, this first week, this is all we do. We get the rules of the road out there. The syllabus is boring. It's no more exciting than anybody else's syllabus, right? But they are informative. If you have a question about the course, I will expect you to go to the syllabus and take a look at it first, because if the question is answered in there, then at least if you're calling to ask for a, you know, a waiver of something or to discuss something in the syllabus, at least I know that we're on the same footing. We know what the rule is. Um, <clears throat> so don't don't call me if you call me and it's something in the syllabus and I refer you back to the syllabus. Don't get mad. I expect you to do that first. Go take a look. Um, there's a syllabus quiz this week. It's the easiest point you're ever going to earn. But it is a requirement. If you don't complete the syllabus quiz, you will not be able to continue in the course. So make sure you do that. And I'd like to go over the syllabus together real quick so that we all are on the same page because I think that just helps us succeed in the end. So first off, let's talk about textbook. There is not a textbook. Uh, I will supply articles, videos, journal pieces. Some are complex. Some are really easy. I mean, a video is pretty easy to watch normally. Uh, they're usually short. <clears throat> journal pieces can get a little more involved, and if they're longer, then you'll spend more time. Um, but I will supply those things. I use text, I won't say normally anymore, but in about half my other courses. Um, but the one thing that uh, I get dinged on usually from students' review is, yeah, we bought this textbook, and we spent 100 bucks, and we really didn't use it much. And that's true. And so <clears throat> in retrospect, and after those student reviews, I said, okay, let's see if I can do some of these courses without. So we're going to try this course without one. What I need from you in the end, and you can either put it in student review or you can just tell me, is <clears throat> I'd like some honest feedback as to whether or not you think the course would have been easier with a textbook. Now, remember, you've already saved the money. So, you know, don't come back and say, oh, yeah, yeah, you definitely don't need a textbook because, you know, it costs money. You've already saved the money. This is for the next people who come up. I really want your honest opinion as juniors and seniors. Was this difficult going without a book? I don't normally follow the books when I use them. I, I use excerpts and, you know, week seven, you may be reading chapter nine and in week two, you might be reading chapter 13. And then, you know, chapter one might be at the end of the course because I don't like to structure my course like somebody else's textbook, right? I know what, how I want things to go and I haven't found a book that matches that yet. <clears throat> and I'm just not going to go and teach from a book because frankly, you're all smart. You could just buy the book and read it and take the tests and probably pass it when we do that. So I just want your honest feedback, but there is no text to buy. I will supply what you need. Generally speaking, you're going to need a, a computer, uh, which you all have uh, as you know, an online course. I'm assuming you all have access to a laptop, and if not, the university has, has computers for you. You will need a printer at some point. Um, and as far as software, there's one week where we use Excel, which is available at the university if you don't have it. Uh, I think it's also available in your, your uh, um, university pack of software that you uh, – that you have access to, so online software. So that's it. 
no textbook. In the syllabus, you'll see there's something listed as, quote, the general policy. And the easiest way for me to explain that is that in this class, I'm the general and you're not, and I get to make and interpret the policies. I can't anticipate everything. I put things in the syllabus and I put certain things the university requires. I put other things that I think will help you succeed in the course, but I can't anticipate everything that's going to happen. Think about the uh, syllabus that you got uh, before COVID-19 hit and then the university closed and went totally online. I mean, who could have written that in just in case we get a you know global pandemic? Here's what we're going to do. We can't do that. So I can't write everything in there. The general policy just basically says I can change the rules. I have the ability to do that. I won't, however, change the rules if it hurts your success. I'm not going to say, um, gosh, you know, we're going to add uh, another term paper in the middle of the, of the uh, class. I have spelled out in the syllabus the deliverables we have. There will be some opportunities. Generally, in my classes, there's opportunities for extra credit. I don't know whether those will pop up, but I like to make those contemporary. If something comes out in the news that's you know, applicable to this class, I may ask if anybody wants to do some research and report out on it <clears throat> for extra credit. Uh, that's fine, but um, I won't do anything as far as changing the rules that's going to hurt you. Um, but I just want everybody to know that there, you know, things happen. Right. And, you know, I don't want anybody coming back. Well, that wasn't in the syllabus. Well, OK, but it is now because life is not something we can program. So just understand that. One of those life issues we can't uh, can't always um, plan for are technical issues. They will happen. They happen in online classes. Um, I will share with you. I am not a technologist. Right. I can I can plan a security system for a multi-million square foot facility. I can, I can plan technology that will protect the supply chain of pharmaceuticals around the globe. That doesn't mean that I'm an expert in the classroom technology at Slippery Rock University and how every, every projector turns on in every classroom. I've had students in classes where I've done them in, in the past and they kind of snicker and it's like, well, okay, go ahead and snicker. I know that I know technology that is important to me and I will learn this technology in the classroom, but I'm not going to spend, you know, years trying to learn how every piece of technology works. The good thing in this class is we have a number of cybersecurity students who I believe would probably be strong technologists. And look, I'm just going to say, look, if I have trouble with something, hey, somebody come up here and handle this for me. And, you know, that's how life works, right? You don't need to be an expert in everything. If you expect your professors to be experts in everything, you have wrong expectations. Um, so things like dynamic links. I'm supplying the reading to you and videos and things. Well, you know, I test everything out on Sundays. Mondays is when our courses, you know, our weeks open. They run from Monday to Sunday, and I test everything on Sunday. And that doesn't mean that the owner of that link didn't take it down on Sunday night after 10 p.m. while I went to bed. I can't, I can't control that. <clears throat> Things like that happen. Sometimes videos fail. Sometimes your version and my version of a particular uh, software package that's running some sort of an application or a, a video or whatever um, may not be in sync. I mean, I do my stuff on an Apple computer because I prefer Apple. Um, but sometimes if I have to make a change, I'll go on my IBM computer. If I'm at my other job, I have a Lenovo laptop I travel with. I may have to hop on there or I may do it on my cell phone. Who knows? Sometimes everything's not in sync. Just understand we're going to muddle through. When the gremlins invade the Internet, we're just going to slap them down and move on. So when, if you get a technical issue, if you can't open something up on a Monday morning, don't panic text me and say, hey, I can't get in the course. I will tell you that D2L is not an easy thing for your instructors. And I think you all saw that during the pandemic, the first couple of weeks. There's a number of buttons that you have to hit more than once to do one, to, to make one change and to start one activity. Sometimes you have to check multiple places to do one thing. Um, <clears throat> I would say that they probably should work on that <laughs> because, I mean, if you hit one, you automatically have to hit the other. Why not just uh, make them a single single action. Um, but it happens. Again, we don't panic. We don't stress. I always say, I don't, uh, I don't get stressed. I'm a carrier. I give stress to other people, but I don't catch it myself. 
I want you guys to get that way too. Don't stress over the stuff. If something goes wrong, goes wrong, we fix it. One thing that's very hard to fix though is late work. There are 20 plus students in this class as of the, uh, the last list I saw this morning. Um, I have another class I teach that has 20 plus students in it. I work a full-time job. Um, I travel. Um, in the first four weeks of this class, I will be, no, first five weeks of this class, I will be home for one week. I will spend some time in New York City at our headquarters. I will spend time here in Western Pennsylvania with you guys. Um, <clears throat> I will spend some time in Atlanta. There's a conference that some of the students, the, um, the uh, organizational security and homeland security students are going to go to, and I'm going as part of my day job, so I will meet them there. Um, so I get it. I understand. And I also got all four of my degrees while working full time. <clears throat> so I get the workload. I understand it. And you guys also have a social life, right? You're 20 something year, year olds. You want a social life. That's fine. I get it. I understand reasons and hate excuses. Please don't call me with excuses why you didn't get something done. If you didn't get something done, you didn't get it done. You know, <laughs> As they say, suck it up, cupcake, and move on to the next week. Late work is not going to be accepted unless I have given permission for it to be late before the due date. And I do that rarely. I mean, somebody calls and says, look, I've, you know, I've got to go in for surgery. I mean, sure. I don't expect you to be under the anesthesia and to be doing a, a, a discussion post. But please don't, you know, don't test me on this. I just don't have time to do it. Um, late work requires special handling because I've got to go back and do corrections and things like that in a, a different, uh, you know, when I'm not doing it for other people. <clears throat> also on discussions, you end up missing the back and forth that I expect from these discussion posts. So I'm not trying to be, you know, a hard guy, but that's, um, that's just the way it is, right? Do your work. You signed up for the course saying that you wanted the credits so you could graduate get a better life. And part of that requirement is doing the work, not trying to be mean, just put in the effort. At the same time, there is a difference between late work and revised work. If you turn in something and I look at it and I say, okay, it looks like there was a significant effort made here, but it's not really what I was looking for, right? I'm dying of thirst and you hand me a sandwich. I mean, you really tried, but it's not the thing we we're looking for. I will call you and or contact you in some way and we'll figure out what went sideways. And if I believe that you put in a significant effort, but just didn't get, you know, the point of the assignment or, or whatever it is, we can talk about redoing those things. And we'll talk about a timeline. We'll talk about if there's going to be any, you know, um, point deductions because you are getting a second bite at the apple. So sometimes that's fair. And I try to be fair with everybody in the course. I do, in this course, uh, I have set aside Thanksgiving week, since we don't have any classes, um, <clears throat> as a time for makeup work. That doesn't mean that if you missed something and didn't turn it in, you get an automatic right to make it up Thanksgiving. But if we've talked about it in the past and I say, okay, I'm going to give you an opportunity to make it up. If it's not something that's timed that I need to have then, like quizzes, right? Those, you know, I can't let that hang out there forever because everybody else has the answers. Um, we will we will set normally Thanksgiving week for any approved revised work to come in. Um, that gives you the opportunity in that week. I know it's Thanksgiving week and it's time away and, you know, you want to be doing other stuff. But again, you put in the effort. And so, you know, we will, we will set that timeline. But a revised work is by invitation only. It, I will call you if I think that, you put in the effort but didn't quite get it right and we can work together to to make it right so we'll do a number of discussion posts in this uh, in this course uh, i will give you a, a discussion topic and uh, you will um, take that topic and run with it and then you will have a back and forth required number of of um, of things that you need to uh, to do and people that you need to talk back and forth with in the class in the discussion uh, uh, forum um, we will go over the format for each discussion. <clears throat> Generally speaking, with the exception of the one you'll do this week, which should be in the first person, they're, they need to be in APA format. Not looking for a cover page and not looking for a reference page unless you use references. <coughs> Excuse me. And if you do use references, you'll get extra points, by the way. Um, but I, I, 
I, the first one needs to be a formal essay. I really do want you to apply the work here to things you've done in the past or things that you hope to do in the future. But that's what you do in the responses. In your initial post, it should be in the third person. If you don't understand what that is, uh, I suggest you look it up. Go to the APA guide, uh, Purdue OWL, the Purdue Online, Online Writing Lab is a great reference point for that. Um, I do know that I, I think that um, cybersecurity um, falls to the sciences, and, and I think you guys use MLA for papers. <clears throat> we use APA in um, the social sciences, which is what this course falls to. Um, so, you know, look, if, if there's a few, when I ask you to write something, I do ask you to use APA format. If I see some MLA sprinkled in there, I'm not going to go haywire on you. Um, but there is a a part of each discussion and part of each grade in the rubric where it says, did you use proper format? So in your initial post, it's, it should read like a third person. Rather than, I think that a blue sky is very pretty, you would say, people tend to think that a blue sky is very pretty. Third person, right? Um, <clears throat> politics, religion, they all have their place. Um, that's great. Uh, but their place is not here. I'm not trying to stifle anybody's First Amendment rights. What I'm saying is that we will not be touching on topics that generally require you to discuss politics, religion, those kinds of things. They're important things to everybody. It is up to you as an academic, because that is what you are, to go over your work and ensure that there is nothing in there that would be considered to be political or religious, or simply, you know, people get offended, right? Sometimes people get offended too much. But it's up to you to go through your writing to make sure that there's nothing in it that's blatantly offensive. Read the syllabus section on discussion posts. It is rather lengthy, but it is written from past experience here and at other schools where I've done discussion posts, where I put out a, you know, a discussion post on, you know, um, you know, what do you think about the flavor chocolate? And somebody's going to tell me that, you know, chocolate is not good because um, Donald Trump or Nancy Pelosi or somebody eats chocolate, therefore it's bad. Or, you know, I think that it's bad because, you know, whatever, right? Stick to the facts. Keep that other stuff out. Be collegial. If you're going to rant, <clears throat> if you're going to be rude, if somebody says something and you're going to come back with, yeah, well, you're wrong. Okay, that's not being collegial. Being collegial just simply means being nice. And I think the easiest way to do that in a discussion post is if you're going to disagree, and I'm going to ask you to disagree with something somebody says at some point, right? Some of the discussion, I'm going to say, you can need to find somebody who has a different take on this than you and understand their point and, you know, explain to them why you think your point might be more valid or accept theirs. You always start with something that you do have in common, something that you agree with. Then you can say, but I think that this might be, you know, a better way to look at it. But if you're going to rant, if you're going to be rude, if you're going to tell people, that's a quick race to the bottom. And I will call you out on it as I have students in the past. The first one is a general warning. The second one is we're going to have to have a sit down. So keep them collegial. Keep it light. Stay as an academic. So we talked a little bit before about contacting me. My office hours are posted. They are on, I believe I have Tuesday nights, um, 6 to 8. And Saturday mornings from 9 to 11, they are odd office hours. It doesn't mean I'm going to be sitting in an office waiting for you. Those are the best times to reach out to me if, you, if you're looking to be regimented about that. But again, I don't mean, mind being contacted at other times. If you're working on something on a Monday night <clears throat> and you're stuck and you say, gosh, I'm not exactly sure what he wants on this. Am I on the right you know, tact here? You just text me. Don't wait until Tuesday from 6 to 8. I don't want you to lose the rhythm of your work having to wait for me. Now, I have 36 hours, I believe, is what the policy is. I'm not positive, but to, to contact you back. But I keep, a, I keep a log of how long it takes me to respond to students. My average time responding to a student in a text message is 12 minutes. That's over the last five years. So you're better off just asking the question when you've got it. If you ask too many questions, I'll call you and say, why do you ask so many questions? And we'll laugh about it and we'll find a better way to communicate. But just just do it. I don't mind talking on the phone. Text me first <clears throat> or email. Always using the, the SRU system. And think of talking to me by phone 
as practice for talking to a future boss. Okay, when you practice things, they get easier. You shouldn't be afraid to pick up the phone and, you know, if I say, okay, give me a call. Don't get all choked up. Some people do. They get nervous. I'm not sure why. I don't bite anybody's head off. But think of it as talking to your future boss. You have a question at work. You need it answered. My bosses have always worked in other states or countries in the last, at least the last 20 years of my career. Um, you know, I haven't had a boss that's been in, well, my boss now is in the same time zone, but he's in New Jersey. So, um, you know, calling people on the phone is what I do. And that's what you're going to do probably for the majority of answers you need. So just get used to it. Uh, I do travel, as I said, and I've got a few domestic trips. I don't have any flights over 20 hours during this term that are planned, um, with a lot of the world still kind of, you know, reopening. Uh, I don't expect that will change. There could be a, a trip to Spain somewhere coming up, um, what I learned just the other day. But other than that, everything should be domestic. And my domestic trips tend to be to the East Coast uh, these days. Uh, I'll do some time, like I said, in the Southeast and in the Northeast. Um, but I don't generally go to California much anymore. Um, so, you know, don't worry about the, the time of day, right? Just text. And if I'm unable to answer, then you won't get an answer uh, until I'm able to answer you back. But don't worry about any of that stuff. If I say I'm traveling, you just send out your request for what you need. And if I'm in, in the air and can't answer you, I'll answer you from the airport when I land. So I posted a weekly schedule in the syllabus. It's a breakdown of what we're going to cover each week. Uh, we might stray a little bit. If something cool happens that I think is a better topic than the one I have planned, that's one of those general policy things, right? Um, you know, if there's a huge security incident somewhere and we see it that it was a, you know, a, uh, a, an example of good or bad security management, we may just jump to that and we'll do a little bit of, of change around. But everything shows what we're going to cover week by week in the current plan, plus the types of assignments and the the points per assignment listed. Um, again, I'm going to try to relate the topics to different security domains because we have a lot of cybersecurity people in here, but this is primarily a protective security course. So, you know, just to manage your expectations, that's the direction that most of my lectures will take. Quick word on academic integrity. Um, you know, the one thing about online classes, is I can see what you've accessed for how long. Um, and look, if you don't, if you don't view the lecture, and you try the discussion post and you happen to hit, you know, all the topics right, I, I can't stop you on that, right? I mean, in a regular class, when someone hands you a textbook, they don't, there's no little mark in the in the page that shows that you actually looked at that page that the instructor would go back and look, right? So I can't do that either. But again, I'm not going to give you the benefit of the doubt if you call me and say, hey, I'm pulling a C in your class and I really need a B. I always love that when students call and they say they're pulling a C or a D and they say, I really need an A. Well, you know, that's, that's easy. Just get an A, right? But I can't really uh, help you if I go back in and I will look. If you want to discuss grades, I will go back because that's the first thing I do is if you're not doing the work, then that's probably the reason that things aren't going the way you'd hoped. Um, I use all tools available to scan papers and discussions. Please don't use somebody else's work. <clears throat> I will tell you, and, and quizzes also have test banks. So no two of you will get the exact same quiz. So please don't just make a list of the 10 or 12 or whatever answers, hand them to your friend because they're going to be really mad at you when they get zero of them right. I mean, they'll they'll get, well, they have a 25% chance of getting a question right if there's four answers in a, in a multiple choice question, right? Um, but I will tell you that plagiarism, if you get caught, um, I will do everything I can to get you bounced, not just from this class, but from the university. I don't have the power to do that. The deans and the president do, but I will tell you that their feelings on plagiarism are not much different than my own. Can you imagine being a senior and getting bounced in your senior year? I will tell you that I had a graduate student who turned in a paper, and it was a exact copy of the Ontario um, um, Private Investigators Guide. It's about a six-page guide that they have for the qualifications. He turned it in in a graduate class. I had just read it because I was hiring a private investigator in Ontario to help with a case. I had read the thing the week before, and when it popped up, I was like, I've seen this. And sure as anything, it was the exact same thing. And he was in his second year of graduate school and was bounced. Okay. And you don't get your reputation back very easily when you do that either. So just don't. And you certainly don't get your tuition back. So just don't do it. Quick word, if you think you have a disability uh, and you uh, desire to make that known to the university, um, 
they will send me a note to tell me whether or not there are any accommodations. Uh, accommodations are need to be fair and in line with the university policies. Um, I have not found any reason really to make many accommodations in these classes. I don't time quizzes. Um, so, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, you know, get test anxiety, right? And so they want extra time to take, take quizzes. I don't time them. There's a timer on there. It's, it comes up at like two hours and it'll reset itself after the two hours. And if it doesn't call me and I'll reset it again. I don't care about that. I mean, I'm not, you know, it's, the quizzes are open book, sort of, like no book, but open to you using references to get them done. So, you know, you may want to spend extra time doing those to look up the answers. I'm cool with that. I mean, I can't stop you from doing it for one thing. And number two, you're actually going out there and trying to learn where the answers are. So it works. Um, if you do believe that you have and need an accommodation of any kind, the Office of Student Disability Services is now located in the Bailey Library. They've moved. If you've used them before, they are in the library now. I encourage you to reach out if you need help. So here's what we're going to cover. This week is introductions, and there's a very specific introduction. It's not just, hi, my name is, this is where I grew up, and have a nice day. There's very specific uh, uh, things I want you to do, and I want you to use your best writing, because that's one of the reasons I have you do that, so I can see where everybody is. Uh, we're going to talk about security as a relationship-driven discipline. If you don't know your coworkers and what their roles are, you will not be a successful security manager or cybersecurity manager or anything, really. Um, we do that through looking through enterprise security risk management eyes. And so we'll be looking at what human resources does, what finance does, what IT does, what engineering and facilities do. All of these organizations, what they do in relation to what the security manager does um, because if you know a little bit about what they do and what their, their responsibilities are, you will be much better at your job because you'll know what resources you have available to you. From there, we'll go to legal and regulatory partners. There are regulations that you need to know about and others that uh, may pop up and you need to know how to go about finding out about those things. We'll talk about external partners, generally speaking, police, um, federal law enforcement, and how you interact with them. And you, you'll see some surprising literature about what they think of you. Um, security teams and how to build them. There's ways to build security teams, the number of people that you have, what each person's role might be. Um, no two teams are exactly alike, but we'll use a general model. And we'll also talk about contracting versus using proprietary uh, help and where you may draw, want to draw that line. We'll talk in depth about security leadership versus management. You know, whether um, writing the rules is enough. You can write the rules, but if no one's going to follow up to make sure people follow them, then what good are they? Or you can be a great leader, but if you don't have some structure and rules, people will still do what they want. Uh, we have an exercise that most of you, especially cybersecurity students, have laughed at in the past. And I'm still putting it in there because um, I think that in the end, they realized that uh, it was necessary. We will do a... a um, an exercise on networking. I'm going to force you to go out and make friends with people um, in your industry. Um, most people believe, you know, things like their LinkedIn page or their, you know, the relationships that they have. You know, I've already done that. So, I, you know, I don't need this. This is a, a juvenile exercise. Well, I will tell you that most of you need some instruction on how to do that properly and how to reach out to people. Those are the people who are going to hire you that you'll be reaching out to. So we're going to get those relationships started now because in the end, this is all about you getting a J-O-B. Um, and then we'll talk about security systems administration and ownership. Um, as, as security gets to be more technical, um, things like you know camera systems and access control systems and alarm systems and drones and other devices, robots, <clears throat> who really owns those and, and how do we administer those systems? As always, there'll be tests and exams. The only real tests, we have some quizzes, but they're not, they're generally not long or hard to take. We will do a midterm. Um, it might be multiple choice and some essay and some other formats. I'm still deciding. Um, you know, I like to, to, to mix it up a little bit, um, but you will have time to do the midterm and there will be a final exam. It's not, it's comprehensive. It covers the entire semester, but it's not a memory test. We're going to go over it in week 14. We'll talk about what the final is going to be like, so you have a general idea. But don't get all jammed up on the fact that, you know, there's a final exam, and if you don't do well in the final, then this is going to happen, and, the, you know, the sky is going to fall, and the whole works. Don't do not don't do that to yourself. Uh, it's not a memory test. It will be, um, generally speaking, it will be a, an opportunity for you to look at scenarios and to apply things you learned in the class 
as to how you might solve some of those scenarios. So that'll be in person for the university schedule. I believe we're on, well, I can't exactly say the date yet because uh, um, I just saw it once and it was a little confusing. So, um, but it will be during finals week and it will be in the classroom that we have uh, scheduled for the class, the, the other in session, um, in-person sessions. So let's talk about those in-person sessions. The dates were sent by email and I will send them again. If you didn't get them, please just let me know. Attendance is mandatory. Okay, if you have conflicts with those dates, solve them now, please. I mean, there's the, the there's one coming up um, week two, but you should have already known about that. Um, if you don't attend one of the in-person sessions, and there are five, including the final exam, um, you will get a zero for that week plus a five-point grade reduction on a 100-point scale. Now, generally speaking, each week has a five-point um assignment or quiz or something attached to it. Um, so absent any extra credit, um, it, you will go down one full letter grade if you miss a session. And if you miss two, you will go down two full letter grades. So if you're an A student and you miss a session, you will be a B student. And mathematically, that's kind of how it works. Uh, I'm driving 300 plus miles to teach the course. The, you know, I would expect that you can you can make it. And we've got plenty of time to plan for things like jobs. And I know that you work jobs. I get it. But you've got plenty of time knowing those dates, in some cases, three, four months ahead of time. Um, the format for these in-person sessions, there'll be a short lecture. And I'm going to try to keep it short, it's certainly shorter than this one. Um, then there'll be a group exercise. And we'll have breakout sessions. And then there'll be a readout of, you know, what your group has determined. And then we'll do a kind of do a, you know, closing group discussion about, you know, what we may garner from that entire exercise. Uh, we're going to take breaks. <clears throat> Definitely take breaks. Um, you know, I'm thinking probably every half hour or so we'll at least take five bio break, right? Um, but, you know, look, if, if we get to that point um, where I'm droning on too much, somebody needs to raise their hand and say, hey, uh, you know, um, we need to take a break. I'm good with that. I want interactive class, right? You're juniors and seniors. You're not, you know, you're not 17 year old freshmen who um, don't get a say in things. You get a say, right? Uh, we will start on time and we will end on time. There is a habit sometimes of instructors who like to end class early because, you know, they've taught all day and now they're teaching at a night class. Sorry, guys, you don't have that luxury. I work all day and I work all night anyway, but we'll start on time <clears throat> and we'll end on time. I will not keep you late, and I will ask somebody in the class during those sessions to be the timekeeper to keep me on, on schedule, um, but we will start on time. Um, no phones except for during breaks. I will ask you to take your cell phone, to put it down in front of you, um, to close your laptops during lecture unless we need them for something. Um, look, you'll survive. A couple of minutes without your phone. You know, you may miss a, a, a meme or a text or something, but you'll be able to get it during break, and we won't be that long between them. But no phones uh, during the, the class sessions. You can certainly use them during breaks, uh, but same with the breakout sessions. If I do come in and find somebody using their phone, I'll ask them to leave. End of that last slide on a happy note. You know, if you use your phone, I'll ask you to leave, but, but please, it's just respect for your fellow classmates. So this week, view the lecture. You're done. You did that part, right? Thank you. Read the syllabus by the end of the week. Take that syllabus quiz by the end of the week. You need to understand the syllabus and you need to certify to me that you need that you did that. Do the introduction post. That's due a Thursday at 5 p.m., your introduction post. And then I need you to comment on two classmates' posts and more if you're so inclined. Um, but there's a specific set of questions in there um, that you may find the answers to interesting with other students. So you may want to talk to them and, and, you know, comment on that. But your initial post, 250 words, that's only one page double spaced. Okay. If you can't write one page double spaced inside of an hour, um, I, I think that's a bit of a stretch, frankly, although maybe it takes you a little longer and that's fine too. But one page is not a heavy lift guys. Um, 250 words initial post, your responses to other people should be around 100 words. Now, I will count the the words in the first ones, and I'll do these the responses if they look amazingly short. But um, less than 100 words, you're really not commenting on somebody's work. You're just, you know, clicking the box 
and saying, yeah, yeah, I did a response, that's disrespectful to the person you're responding to. And I, I do insist that you respect your fellow classmates. So that's all spelled out in the, uh, in the uh, instructions for your, um, for your discussions this week. Okay, last slide. We're going to close out here. This week, I'm in Michigan until Sunday. Uh, then I'm going to head to, to Pennsylvania. Um, next few weeks, like I said, I'm on the road a couple different places. Um, hopefully the airlines will <laughs> cooperate, although they haven't for other people in the last uh, several months. So we'll see how that works out. Uh, feel free to reach out, even if you know I'm going to be away. Um, I can't help you if you don't give me the chance to help you. So please, just, just do that. Just text me. The number's here on the bottom. It's in the syllabus. Um, you paid for this course. And I'm obligated to provide a service to you. Not obligated to provide an A grade, but I am obligated to provide a service. And I take that very seriously that I am at your disposal to, to help you through the course. So please text me, email me at the SRU address if you need me for anything. With that, um, have a great first week in week two. Uh, I will send out the assignments on Sunday night, and you will see that. I would appreciate it. it. Just a heads up, there's some reading to do before we get together on Wednesday night um, the, on, in week two. So with that, everybody have a great first week, and I look forward to seeing you all in week two in person.